Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the ninth episode of the School of Resistance. Bonsoir tout le monde et bienvenue à ce neuvième épisode de l'École de la Résistance. Um, I hear the um, French translation now. I don't know what is happening, but... Uh... <laughs> okay. Um, so, hello again. Welcome to the ninth episode of the School of Resistance, a live stream format that invites experts around the world to discuss valuable alternatives for the future and to create a blueprint for politics of resistance. The project is a collaboration between Entegent, IIPM, Academie der Künste, and this ninth episode is hosted in collaboration with Schauspielhaus Zurich, GA Waldviertler, Brot für alle, Lem Afrika Bukavu, Afrewatch Lubumbashi, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, and Public Eye. Today's episode is called A Global Jurisdiction for a Global Economy. All over the world, multinational companies are violating human rights, disregarding labor rights, relocating people and destroying habitats without being held accountable. Often, states depend on corporate investments or a few corrupt politicians earn enough from them to accept the damage to the population. With complicated and dynamic networks of subcontractors and the outsourcing of risky businesses, responsibility becomes diffuse. In addition, sophisticated strategies of tax avoidance and tax havens are used. The, resources, the results are devastating. The overexploitation of the planet's resources for the production of cheap Product is driving the collapse of the global ecosystem. Global economic inequalities fuel social conflicts and force people to flee. Together with the lawyer and vice legal director of the European Center of Constitutional and Human Rights, Miriam Sagemas, who is here present with us, and the lawyer and chief investigator of the Congo Tribunal, Silvestre Bissimwa. We will speak about global justice tonight. My name is Eva Maria Berci. I'm a dramaturg, and I've been working uh, for years now with uh, IIPM and Milo Rau. Um, and this School of Resistance is somehow dedicated to the Colvesi hearings of the Congo Tribunal, a global economic tribunal of the civil society initiated by um, Milo Rau in 2015. Um, I would like to introduce the two guests of uh, this evening, Silvestre Bissimwa. He is, uh, as I said, the lawyer and chief investigator of the Congo Tribunal. Um, in, at the beginning of October, so some weeks ago, he, uh, together with the lawyer and human rights activist Selin Chisena, he traveled to Katanga in the south of uh, DRC, the main mining region uh, of the Congo. And with the Colvesi hearings, they are continuing the activities of the Congo tri Tribunal three years after the release of Milo Rao's documentary film. They investigate the responsibility of political elites and multinational companies in a series of human rights, human rights violations, cases of environmental pollution and corruption. On the 25th of October from um, 4 to 7, so this coming Sunday, the hearings will be summarized, debated, and the preliminary verdict will be given at Schauspielhaus Zurich. The event can be followed as a live stream on the IIPM Facebook page. And the final session and uh, deliberations of the tribunal will take place afterwards uh, next year in February in Colvesi, so in the south of um, DRC. The second guest, Miriam Sagemans, will be leading the investigations in Zurich. She coordinates the business and human rights program at ECCHR. She has worked on various cases against corporations, uh, including proceedings against Lidl relating to the exploitation of workers in Bangladesh and Pakistan. 
and against company, companies trading in cotton picked by forced child labor in Uzbekistan. I met Miriam for the first time um, at the Berlin hearings 2015, where she was uh, on stage as an expert. And since then, we were uh, wow. regularly collaborating with ECCHR and I in IIPM's projects such as General Assembly and others. Thank you, Miriam, Miriam and thank you, Sylvest, to be here um, with us. I quickly want to remind you uh, of the possibility for you to engage in the conversation by asking questions. So everybody um, can just send an email to school of resistance at entegent.be or by commenting on the live stream on the Facebook pages of Entegent and IIPM or on Twitter via the hashtag School of Resistance. So please contribute to the discussion. Before we start the conversation, I would like to show a video in 2017, shortly before the official premiere of the Congo Tribunal. We traveled to Bukavu and Goma in Eastern Congo to show the film to the protagonists of the people um, affected by the crimes and uh, devastations shown in the film. When we saw the reactions of the public in Congo that you will see in the film, we knew that somehow we had to continue uh, the work of the tribunal. And I think you understand it when you see the video. So um, please. Alors on va faire vraiment, on va donner la place au public après pour ajouter, pour clarifier les choses, pour critiquer. Moi je n'ai pas été d'accord avec l'appellation tribunal virtuel parce que je trouve que ce tribunal a été très proche de la réalité. Quelles sont les initiatives qui sont mises en marche en fait de réconforter cette population rondamétrie La flamme que Milo vient d'allumer, nous ne devons pas l'éteindre. Les Congolais doivent s'approprier cette, cette flamme et poursuivre. Ce film est aujourd'hui pour nous un élan pour briser le silence et vouloir les changements. Je demanderai à Isdesbal Biabouzé, qui est le représentant du gouvernement provincial dans cette salle, que nous voulons ces changements-là. Plus jamais des contrats léonais dans le secteur minier. Parce que tout le problème auquel nous faisons face aujourd'hui, selon la réalité vécue dans les films, provient du secteur minier. Il faut aussi que les leaders accomplissent ces tâches, donnent aussi des réalités sur le terrain pour que ces films soient accomplis. Aussi, il faut que l'État congolais accepte de faire des élections indépendantes et transparentes. Ça, c'est ma préoccupation pour que, pour que la, la, la population retrouve la paix. Le 
Le plus grand problème de ce pays, comme on le dit, le poisson commence par courir par la tête. On ne va pas demander à vous de changer, non. C'est nous qui devons changer. Il est Wakati Uko, président de l'Assemblée nationale. Pour Nini, Wakati leo unaangalia ifini pale watu wenyewe waliwao watu wenyewe biko bananyanganywa bananyanyasiwa ifini walifanya mbele ya viongozi ukisema kwa kwa Walikuwa wanakambilia mabaya yenyewe walifanya kwa kuti kutiheshimu mimi naita manque d'honneur si ba kongomani tunakosa culture ya honneur ça ça m'a révolté euh, de voir ce film et à la fin quand on dit qu'on a condamné le gouvernement et moi je me suis dit mais écoutez euh, c'est le moment on doit le faire partir on doit changer le gouvernement pour qu'on ait des gens qui sont capables de protéger la communauté de protéger le peuple au lieu de continuer toujours dans cette misère dans cette souffrance moi il faudrait qu'on l'arrête c'est vrai qu'on doit mobiliser la communauté on doit mobiliser le peuple nous sommes vraiment anesthésiés nous n'avons pas choix pour la mouka Tunalala sana, tunasizia sana, tunapashwa kulamuka na tuexige tupate hiyo tribunal yenye ta sikiliza kila mtu, itaishimia droit ya kila mtu. Hiyo ni ka moja. Tuliona hiyo ka ya ba international, ma entreprise international, politique ekonomike yenye na aswa. Vile vile tunapashwa la muka. Hiyo maka yote tuliona inapashwa kutufungula macho na kutuondoa ndani ya usingisi na tunapashwa kusema kama trop c'est trop on nous traite comme des idiots on en a assez nous devons nous réveiller voilà So, um, Miriam, I have a first uh, question for you. Um, from a European perspective, the history of the Congo begins with the Berlin Conference. The Congo was founded to provide, provide Europeans with raw materials that they lacked for their industrial production. Cities like Kolvesi were founded um, because they were located near major mines, um, and so they needed workers to and do the exploitation of the, the mines. And to this day, the ne negative effects of the European or the worldwide production of goods are simply being outsourced to countries um, into, in the so-called Global South. You um, have been working a lot with uh, activists worldwide, for example, the textile workers, uh, trade unionists in Bangladesh and Pakistan, so you know very well this neo-colonial system of exploitation and um, of humans and nature in the global south. And uh, you told me once that in all this uh, debate, it is somehow surprising that we don't talk so much about the fact that many structures so, such as property rights and the distribution of wealth have simply being preserved after the independence um, in countries such as India or Congo, for example. So um, why is it so difficult to tackle global inequalities and power relations? And what are at the moment the most worrying consequences of the neo-colonial outsourcing of the negative effects of our production? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, also, first of all, for, for inviting me and for having me to speak uh, here. Thank you so much. Um, um, yes, it's also very nice to see Silvestre again. <laughs> it's very, um, very nice we can all meet here, even though it's only digitally. No, so I think um, 
Well, I think there are two reasons. I think Merci, Myriam. For us... Merci, Myriam. Moi aussi. Content. Plaisir partagé. <laughs> Thank you, Myriam. Pleasure shared. Um, Thank you. So, um, uh, you know, I think for us living in Europe or North America, um, the, the consequences of this business, of this model of our, how our economy is structured are, are so far away. And, um, and I think there are some, uh, some uh, Austrian German sociologists have created um, this term of imperial lifestyle. And that is, I think that we all as um, citizens living in the global North um, are very much and have always been benefiting from the exploitation of others and our whole economic system is built on the externalization of costs and um, standards for uh, um, humane live, live, uh, working conditions, environmental standards, all of these standards, it turn into eventually into costs if you only look at from the perspective of profit making, um, which is the driver of, of our global economies. And, um, and I think our way of life is so uh, much intertwined with this system of exploitation that that is really difficult for us to see. Um, and I think it's very difficult for us to grasp um, the fact that, that our life would have to look very different if we wanted to really change the system. And then there's a, ses a second aspect, which, I, I, so what I'm trying to say is I think that the way we live and all the benefits that we have seen in the in in the global north, at least in Europe, but I would also say in North America, sort of with the welfare states that have been emerging and so on, the social welfare states, it's all been built on the fact that we that there's um, we can benefit from exploitation elsewhere, which we don't see anymore because it's not in Europe, but it's outside and it's it's globalized. Um, and then I it's um, I think law also plays a particularly important role. And that is um, that law is creating the opportunity for companies, for business actors to, um, to, to work globally, to extract resources uh, from countries like the Congo or India, extract resources or use uh, the, the labor force there and um, it is done so, this is the, the, this, your world economic system is crafted through law. So that's free trade agreements, it's bilateral investment tra treaties, all of this that enables um, uh, uh, economy. And then at the same time on a different level that is more when it comes to company structures, when it comes to um, you know, legal techniques to evade tax taxes, to evade taxing, you know, you just create different corporate structures and you can distribute, you know, the revenues there to avoid more taxing. So there are many uh, uh, legal ways of how companies can shield themselves from where the real harm and the really the exploitation of humans and nature happens. Um, and, and we believe that it, for us, this all seems like very neutral, legitimate business. And we don't see, and it, it is designed through law and the law gives this, gives also the, leg, the legitimacy to that system. Um, and, and I think, well, at the moment, I think not, not only do we see, I think through, as, as we are also all more globally more interconnected, I think, uh, you know, the news about catastrophic events uh, in the Congo, in the mines, but also, you think about factories, uh, textile factories in, in South Asia, I think we, we uh, more and more probably cannot avoid this reality. You know? At least I'm hoping that we can less, more and more not avoid this reality anymore. Plus, I think that uh, climate, the climate crisis clearly puts, will put, or puts an end, or will put an end to our way of, of, of producing and, um, and doing economy. Um, yes, thank you, Silvestre. You uh, went to Colvesi, where the Swiss commodity trader Glencore operates two of the largest cobalt mines 
of the world. About 70% of the world's cobalt production takes place in DRC. Cobalt is the most important raw material for the worldwide production of uh, batteries. And you now spoke with more than 30 experts and witnesses in the last uh, weeks. What is the outcome of the Colwesi hearings? Does the mining of cobalt and copper in the region of, um, of uh, Katanga, so in the south of Congo, also have positive effects on the uh, economy and on the um, welfare of the local population or mainly negative ones? And has this always been the case historically? Merci Eva. Euh, merci aussi de me donner l'occasion. Thank you, Eva, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this event. I also would like to thank uh, Miriam for the fact of uh, being here, and uh, it is a real pleasure to see you again uh, after uh, what we have been together in uh, Berlin. Now. I was so passionate uh, that I now participate uh, in the uh, Colwesi project uh, because we as uh, Congolese people uh, wanted to participate uh, because uh, we uh, now really see uh, that uh, this is something that can obtain something. I mean, the Congo Tribunal was really a channel, a channel in which we can participate as uh, Congolese people, but this is also something to denounce uh, the uh, non-respect of uh, the human rights. Uh, we can also talk about the multinationals and everything that uh, they're doing in Congo. So so that's why we've decided uh, that we have to continue this work. And uh, the uh, tribunals uh, of the civil society are very important. And now with the uh, COVESI, we are very uh, proud that we can participate in this project uh, with the Congolese people, uh, with all of you, with some of the multinationals. Uh, I mean, what is the result? after uh, uh, the uh, Colwesi auditions. Well, let's say that the result are at different levels. With the Tribunal of Colwesi, we have uh, researched uh, the political responsibility uh, we also looked at the uh, responsibilities uh, of the multinationals. And we looked at four cases. We had the mining contracts uh, between uh, the different partners. And so we asked ourselves the questions, uh, is this contract, uh, who profited from it? Was it the state? Was it the workers? Uh, was it the multinational? And then we looked at uh, the pollution. I mean, when those companies uh, pollute the fields in the surrounding, uh, when they uh, create uh, a lot of pollution, uh, uh, they also cause damage to the nature, to the human beings. And so this is something that we looked at as well. And then the third case uh, was also the accidents. Uh, I mean, uh, we... Uh, wanted to find out uh, who's responsible if an accident happens. Uh, is it uh, the multinational? Is it uh, the uh, state? Uh, because there are a lot of accidents happening. Uh, so who is to blame? Now, we looked at those four cases and we actually came to different conclusions. I don't know if I have enough time to go over all the conclusions, but when we talk about mining contracts, for example, well, we had a lot of experts and they told us uh, that uh, outsourcing is a very good problem. Uh, now, before we uh, needed capital, of course, uh, um, and unfortunately, uh, 
the uh, state company uh, got capital, uh, but uh, that capital did not go to the state. It uh, did, didn't even go to the, the workers there. It was a mechanism that they worked out uh, to uh, only profit uh, for a few, only a few people, uh, some multinationals like Glencore, but also some individuals uh, profited from it. Uh, and they just worked out uh, a very complicated strategies uh, to make sure that that mining contract only profited to a few people. Uh, and the experts said uh, that this was corruption. And what uh, is corruption all about? Well, corruption is uh, all about the under evaluation of the price when they bought it, uh, they could buy it uh, very cheaply. And normally when you sell something, you have to take uh, into account uh, the infrastructure which is there, the buildings which are there, the roads which were built, uh, the schools that were there so that the workers got a training. Uh, well, all that infrastructure wasn't uh, taken into account uh, to determine the price. Uh, and uh, a lot of damage was done, uh, but no price was paid for the damage to this generation and the future generations. Uh, and then a second thing that we noticed is that those individuals and those uh, uh, multinationals, uh, there were a lot of uh, different multinationals and actually they all uh, took advantage of the weakness of our state. So that uh, these mining contracts uh, did not do anything uh, for the Congolese state, uh, but that the profit went into the pockets of a few people. And no one is doing anything, and the international community isn't, the World Bank isn't. And we wanted to know, were they aware of all of this? Uh, were they aware of it, and which role have they been playing? And the experts said, well, they were well informed. They were well informed, but they just made sure that those individuals could do whatever they wanted. They knew about it, they knew that the contractor that they were going to sign wouldn't be profitable at all to the Congolese st state and only to those few individuals, but they just uh, said that they uh, didn't want to do anything about it, basically, and then also uh, tax uh, evasion, for example, uh, Glencore, that uh, company, uh, and Moby and KCC, well, they uh, all practiced uh, fiscal evasion in different ways. We have seen that the companies uh, in get a certain period of time where they don't have to pay any taxes. After that period, all of a sudden, they just close down those companies. So once they have to start paying taxes, uh, they close down. And that is a very good way to fraud and to uh, evade uh, taxes. And then there were also companies who at the end uh, of that uh, period, when they didn't have to uh, pay taxes, well, they claim bankruptcy. But they aren't bankrupt at all, but they just claim bankruptcy. Or they say that they just don't make any benefit. They say, no, there's no benefit in this country or in this country. Uh, company, uh, and of course there is, but they just uh, know how to make sure that on paper there is no profit. And then other companies, uh, they just lower the benefit they make. And we've also seen that there are companies uh, who do not pay taxes uh, on uh, the expats. So what do they do? They ask expats to come to Congo. Uh, now they should pay uh, wages, but they say, no, they are consultants. And if they are consultants, so they don't have to pay taxes on that salary because they are not real workers, but they are consultants of the company. And so they were able to evade a lot of taxes. Uh, something else that uh, we have seen, and this is something... Uh, that uh, 
is an answer to the second part of your question. Uh, this whole mining industry in uh, the region of Katanga and Kolowezi, well, who is uh, profiting from it? Is it a local population or is it the company owners? Well, they say that there are a lot of uh, resources uh, in that region, natural resources, uh, many people, uh, many multinationals. Uh, Glencore was there, but not only Glencore, many other companies. Uh, but the people are still poor. The people are still living in utter poverty. Uh, and that is a real contrast. The region is so rich. There are so many natural resources. All those companies are there. And the companies, they always say, well, we come and we're going to improve your living standards. And But the majority of the local population is still very, very poor. And let's talk about pollution. The experts and the witnesses uh, told us that uh, Momi and Kassassé, both sides from Glencore, well, everywhere they uh, say that they are not responsible for anything. They don't want to recognize their responsibilities. Uh, and if they do recognize their responsibility, they try to negotiate. But they negotiate in their own ways. They don't really negotiate. They just say, this is what you have to accept. And when they come to an agreement, very often the company doesn't do everything they're supposed to do. For example, there was a, a village. Now, the fields of that uh, village uh, were damaged. Uh, because uh, there was uh, acid uh, running over the fields, uh, so they couldn't grow anything anymore. And the company said, okay, we'll pay something. So they paid the value of the harvest, but for many years, the farmers couldn't use their fields and they only paid for one harvest. They also said, by the way, that they were going to train the farmers, that they were going to give them production means, uh, but they never did. And so they say, well, let's negotiate, but it's on their conditions. And then even if they reach an agreement, uh, they don't do what they agreed to do. Now, when we asked the experts, uh, so how do you think, uh, or why do they comp ask like that? And they say, Momi is just uh, acting like a republic in a republic. Momi is just uh, walking over the state, walking over justice. They are not afraid of anyone because they know that even if they would be brought before a tribunal, that they won't be punished at all. And we were very surprised and we wondered about it. I mean, they come, they take all the natural resources. They don't respect anything. The international standards are not respected at all and they can just do what they want. And when there are accidents, what have the experts told us about that? I mean, they have been able to prove that that uh, the mm, companies were responsible for many accidents because people would go there. KCC was aware of the fact that those people came in there to work. Uh, they didn't do anything to make sure that those people weren't there. They didn't make sure that they weren't able to go there, uh, but um, they went there, uh, especially in the copper mines, for example. Uh, there were a lot of uh, accidents with people who were going to look for copper uh, in those mines, uh, in the private mines. And now the Congolese state, uh, well, they uh, just uh, gave all these mining areas to these multinationals and the local population can't mine anymore. And people still go there. They try to make a living. Uh, then an accident happened. But the uh, multinationals uh, don't want to take any responsibility. Can I still continue or do I have to uh, close down? Try to close down, uh, to close um, 
Sylvestre, but uh, uh, last statement. <laughs> Donc, uh, oui, oui. Uh, le... Okay. One thing that I've noticed is that the people of those regions are, they've lost hope, I think. They are a little bit in despair. They uh, are fed up with uh, Mumi and Kassese and the way they have acted uh, and the fact uh, that there's no positive impact on their lives. Uh, that's the first thing. And then secondly, when those companies pollute the whole area or they damage uh, the health of the local populations, well, then those companies don't take any responsibility. They don't take into account uh, the needs of the population, the health of the population, uh, and those companies uh, violate, exploit the people without even trying to respect international law or Congolese law. Thanks, Sylvester. Um, Miriam, an, an initiative is currently being discussed uh, in Switzerland that would allow companies uh, like Glencore uh, to be, um, uh, it would allow the people in Congo um, to, um, um, well, or Glencore, uh, companies like Glencore to be charged in Switzerland if they commit human rights violations and pollute their environmental, uh, their en environment abroad. And the initiative and many NGOs that uh, publish reports of human rights violations by companies are often accused by of unilaterally demonizing uh, the companies. So. Actually, who is to blame? Are the multinationals to blame or the governments in the country where they operate? Or um, where, must, where must change take place in the Western state where the companies are based uh, and the products are consumed or in the states where the raw materials are mined? Well, I think um, this accusation is, is really, um... It's quite a hollow, it's quite a hollow argument, in my opinion, um, because obviously it is not, and it's 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 not no one who works on the situation seriously would ever doubt that the government of the Congo has a responsibility to ensure that human rights of their citizens are being protected. I think no one really wants to question that, and um, uh, it. But, and I think obviously uh, human rights treaties um, are clearly obliging states like the Congo and like Pakistan, India, all of them, to um, ensure that uh, their citizens especially also can enjoy um, economic and social and cultural human rights and, and any other human rights. Um, and of course, those countries, a lot of times, and the, the governments don't do enough and they don't do what they should do. Um, but, and then here we come, is because they are, a lot of times they are captured by corporate interests. And it is very clearly that also how our economic system is set up, governments must be interested in um, attracting foreign investments. And that means because they are, this is, and they must be ensuring that, you know, trade barriers are, are, um, are um, abolished as a precondition to gain World Bank or IMF um, uh, credit. So, you know, just to say, oh, you're taking away responsibility. No, it's not, that is not, I think the aim of such initi initiatives, the aim of such initi initiatives is to finally also address the responsibility of actors in Europe. And that is, I think also the European governments, also the governments have a responsibility. Uh, this is all debated another, term of extraterritorial human rights obligations of, of, uh, of governments. And that is that they regulate their companies better. And that is exactly that they need to regulate and, in, uh, um, and introduce laws like the one that is being demanded and sh shortly being voted for in, in, in Switzerland. So that finally companies start to have a, somewhat of a responsibility to uh, ensure and to, to sort of exercise their human rights 
what is called the human rights due diligence obligations towards subsidiaries and potentially, I think, also first tier um, suppliers. So this is not about, you know, shifting any blames and pretending and, and, and saying that no one is responsible, but it's actually uh, uh, creating responsibility where at the moment there's, a, a, you know, great irresponsibility. So. And and what uh, can what is actually uh, at the moment because there there are a lot of debates um, and discussion about uh, uh, similar initiatives in in, in all uh, Europe. What, what is actually uh, what are the models? How can um, these things be improved in in Europe at the moment? Yeah, a pioneer um, is, is France. Uh, in France, there is already a law, um, I think it's in, legis it's in, in force already now for two years. Um, it's a, called the Loi de Vigilance. So, um, and it obliges uh, companies to exercise their human rights due diligence as it is described in uh, uh, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. That means that companies, um, this is a law in France, it's um, for its binds French companies, companies that are headquartered in France, and they have an obligation to um, analyze human rights risks with regards to their whole business enterprise activities. So that means also towards their whole supply chain, and they need to um, identify potential human rights risks and then come up with pro appropriate measures to mitigate those risks. And if risks realize and harm occurs, then that law also uh, potentially provides um, remedy for persons affected, which means that persons can also go to France and ask for damages. But that is um, sort of a second, a second step. In the first step, um, it is also possible for civil society organizations and for affected persons to claim that a company has not been exercising their human rights due diligence properly and to, do, to ask the court to order that um, company to change their business practices. Um, the law is, um, we've just been filing last week um, a case under this law with, uh, together with um, a Mexican uh, indigenous community um, uh, who's claiming that their, their rights have been violated in, context, in the context of the building of a wind park. Um, and I think there are, there are three more such cases currently. Uh, pending. And in Germany, we're also demanding a similar law that is also, you know, somewhat close to, to what is being discussed in Switzerland. And um, they're also uh, in the Netherlands, they are more sector specific. So they, they are debating a law that is against uh, child labor. for example. So, and I think in general, I mean, you have that on the national level in the EU, then there's a certain dynamic at the um, uh, at the EU level where um, the EU has announced that they will start a, a procedure to um, legislate an EU regulation and you have discussions and negotiations at the UN, at the United Nations, um, also on a treaty that exactly obliges every country um, that signs on to, to this treaty to um, also legislate company, uh, companies better. Yeah. Um, Silvas, when we began to prepare uh, this, uh, this Colvesi hearing, so the continuation of the Congo Tribunal, and that became somehow your project now, and uh, the project also of our um, team in, in Bukavu, Lem Africa, uh, the team that worked with uh, us, with the IIPM on this first uh, tribunal. And nevertheless, you always said, that you need us somehow in DRC, you need the presence of Europeans in DRC to make this debate happen, no? Why, why can't you make this, uh, have this deba debate without us or the, without our presence there? And why is it so difficult for the Congolese government to introduce laws that benefits uh, the Congo and, and, uh, and the people living in Congo. And um, as they did, for example, with the new mining law in 2000, 
um, 18. And why is it so difficult to enforce these laws against the companies? Voilà. Uh, pour pour le, la, la continuité du Thank débat. You. Well, regarding the continuation of the debate. Indeed, I always said that I need you, I need your presence, and this for different reasons. First, it is necessary to have a cooperation between a Congolese team and an international team. And this for a very simple reason. Even if we are dealing with uh, Congolese cases with violations of the law in Congo, we need the international uh, cooperation because we are dealing with international companies. So it's necessary to have this support um, to uh, know more about uh, the case and to enrich uh, one another. We need the international community so that we could also report back at an international level such cases. Because as I said, the international community is involved, so we have to report back. And we also want to continue with the uh, lobbying action, because the aim of the first uh, Milo tribunal and of our own tribunal, so the aim would be to change things and to contribute to the development of uh, uh, Congo. So it is necessary to have this advocacy work in Congo, but also uh, elsewhere. We also have to, to conduct that advocacy work at an international level, as Mir Miriam just said. And of course, we have this uh, theater or film, and therefore we also need a technical support. We need some advices. And this is why this uh, cooperation between my team and your team is so important. We have to, to do something in common, in common and something that would be consistent. And finally, we need you because it would be impossible to do what we are doing without money, without resources. And it's very difficult to collect uh, money uh, in Congo. And that's why you are also very necessary. And I would like to, to grasp this opportunity to express my thanks to all of you, to all institutions, all the partners that helped us, that provided money for us to organize that uh, tribunal. And also all the organizations that helped for the dissemination of that film, which is uh, very successful. And the uh, Kolwezi hearings are also uh, very well uh, welcomed in, in the different uh, Katanga provinces and everywhere. So this cooperation is very, very important and very helpful. Now, coming back to your second question, the law and why is it so difficult for the uh, Congolese uh, government to uh, enact laws that would be um, to the benefit of its people and of its companies. I would like to say that it's not really difficult, but there is a lack of willingness. Congolese authorities are not willing to introduce good laws. Second thing, there is an absence of political leaders with a vision uh, a, a good vision for the country. We don't have good leaders who love Congo and who would like to work for uh, Congolese people who really want Congo to develop. So we are lacking uh, such uh, good leaders. And we also have a problem rega regarding patriotism. If uh, some people took advantage of mining contracts, it's just because they don't like the country. So it's a problem of patriotism and also ethics and the integrity of political leaders. If at the head of the country, you don't have uh, um, people with um, a role of 
a model role in terms of uh, ethics, you're not going to have uh, laws that would benefit the population. And then, of course, impunity. They are not going to uh, uh, enact laws that are going to sanction their bad behavior. So each time there is a law that could be a, a, a break to what they are doing, of course, they're not going to uh, approve such legislation. And uh, finally, you were asking whether it is complicated to uh, apply to enforce law, uh, laws um, against uh, companies. No, it's not difficult, but there is a lack of willingness, as I said. We also have a, a judiciary uh, system which is uh, really under the, the influence of, of the president uh, and uh, they are all intertwined, the executive, the judiciary, the president, well, everything is intertwined. And laws are there, but we don't enforce them just because the institutions which are supposed to apply the, the law are either weak or are afraid, are under the pressure of uh, the heads of state, of uh, the authorities which are at the head of the state, and the enforcement uh, agencies are also involved in corruption cases or fraud cases. For instance, experts told us what were they told about uh, a fraud or corruption case? Multinationals cannot give subcontracts to foreign companies. So this is forbidden. But we realized that Congolese are involved in subcontracting. They even create uh, companies so they're not going to, again, to approve or to enforce laws regarding subcontracting or outsourcing. So just in a nutshell, uh, we have uh, lots of problems and that's what I, I wanted to say, to, to enforce the law, it's difficult. Um, Miriam, uh, we, with uh, this uh, Congo tribunal, we, we um, are now trying to um, to have a kind of a transnational dialogue now between uh, the Congo, Switzerland, and uh, and Europe, um, and uh, you have a lot of experience of working together with activists all over the world. And what, in your opinion, is um, how kind of transnational dialogue uh, of, of of this kind has to be? shaped and, and organized to, to make it work, that it doesn't, uh, that it could become something um, like a horizontal dialogue, that it's not uh, only, that we are not only reproducing also power hierarchies that are existing in other, in other sectors. Yeah, um, probably um, I, I first, because before I come to that, I first have, have a comment on, on what Sylvester just said, and I think also, just to stress what he what he just said is to that, and um, this is why we need. Also, this is the, the content part of why transnational dialogue is needed because there are the different perspectives must be seen and brought together. And um, and I think also uh, just as we just heard Sylvester speaking, I think none of those business lobbyists could now say that we were we are ignoring the responsibility of any state. Um, in in certain you know bad situations, but I think the thing is, there's also always a question: Well, whose responsibility is is it to speak about which issue? And I think for Europeans, we are in a very good position to speak about the responsibility of the European actors. And I think I also just want to stress again how powerful companies are. And I think th those corporations are usually in those those CSR people they're so good in talking us into on how complex this is and how little power they have because the republic you know the DR, the government of the DRC and I know this from the textile industry it's always the Bangladeshi factory owners that know everything and that the poor brands can't do anything and then 
just as one stark example in the COVID crisis, when the crisis hit and all of Europe was in shutdown, lockdown, and all clothes shops, um, all textile shops closed down, within all major brands canceled their contracts completely illegally. I've analyzed with colleagues and we published this also, the, the contracts, it's, it's absolutely no legal basis. They, they, they were able to, or just as Glencore is able just to shut down a mine for whatever reason, they can just decide to do that. And it, irrespective of that, if that's legally possible or if that's, you know, whatever. So they can just cancel all their contracts, say we're not paying even for the products that are already on the way to Europe. And within two, two or three weeks, all of Bangladesh was basically on the verge of collapse, of economic collapse. So I think that, you know, and that's just one country, one example that is in textile industry. And the same goes for others. So I think we simply cannot underestimate the power companies have, irrespective of what they always say. Um, and then, then on this question, how do we, so, so that's why I also feel like we need, we, we, we just need to talk about the same issue from those different perspectives and those different perspectives must have their room. And especially, I think, uh, and, and that's sort of, if you think it through for Europe, it's especially important that in Europe, the voices of Sylvester and, and Nazir and Sarah and others are being heard because those voices must be represented here in the public debates. And it can't be just us talking about the others. And the same in my experience is also that, of course, now if, if they're Europeans and if they can speak in the Congo, that that also makes a difference because it does create a, a different attention than if just Sylvester by himself is, is saying this. So I think this is what, what the benefit is that we need to understand that we can um, lend each other legit, legit, legitimacy and also strengthen. We need to find ways so that we can strengthen each other's struggles and positions. Now, I think in order to do so, we also must be very much, I think it does, it needs, uh, we all must be very much aware of where we are at, what our privileges are. So, it, and that obviously means, especially for those coming from the global north, it's, it does take a lot of reflection on uh, privileges, on, on assumptions that we have of coming from a certain background and assumptions that we have on how work, for example, like it's very practical and I think, and also it's actually a very personal thing of, you know, who am I and why am I speaking about what in this context and what does that mean that I'm here in this context? Um, I think it means also that um, we must be very honest with one another and must be also willing um, you know, to, to go through some conflict in a constructive way, because there are misunderstandings easily, and there will be misunderstandings. And I think that is something um, that we must be willing to engage in. And that may sometimes take much longer than we wish for. Um, but I think, especially from, from sort of this Northern perspective, I think where we're all a lot about efficiency and getting things done quickly, um, uh, those, those, Collaborations take time, and it takes time uh, to build up trust uh, and, and mutual understanding. Oh, sorry, I have, to, I have a question from the public. Um, well, it's actually a, a long comment, but I would uh, only uh, try to, to read the, the, the question. Um, so my question is, could it not be a point to underline very explicitly and loudly that the Congo tribunal actually is fiction and that this is the scandal, is a scandal. The fictive character of the tribunal makes obvious the problem that there is no real and official, official tribunal. The fictive, fictive dimension of the tribunal can be seen as a claim to enact a real and official tribunal. Um, well, it's uh, actually more a comment than a, than a question, but perhaps uh, I would um, I would like to ask uh, to to add another question and to say, but um, if um, if the Congo Tribunal is a kind of a model or like a, a some kind of a, a utopia of this World Economic Tribunal or of a global jurisdiction for a global 
economy. Um, how should this uh, actually look like, this global jurisdiction, or, or in, in, your, in your opinion? Uh, what would be like the, the best uh, model um, for this? And I would like to ask it, of course, to uh, both of uh, you. Oui, euh, pour moi, pour moi, c'est possible. Hein? I think it's possible to have a such a global tribunal for global economy. The Congo tribunal is not a utopia. It is a very good initiative and we already have a very positive consequences. We already see the impact when we uh, went uh, through Europe with the film, we got a lot of reactions. Uh, people who saw that film uh, changed their habits. Uh, people were surprised. Uh, people said, is this really happening? Uh, people uh, got a lot of courage as well when they saw that this was happening, when they saw that this was possible, when they saw that we could actually do something about it. A lot of Congolese people got hope out of it, got proud out of it. Uh, so yes, we can change things. We can change the rules. And what kind of model do we need uh, as a uh, tribunal? Uh, I think we should try to work out a different kind of economy. An economy where the human beings are at the center of the economy. Companies who take care of their individuals instead of what they do today. We have companies who exploit their workers. They don't even care about their workers. They don't even care about values, about universal rights. They don't really care about the individuals that work for them. And just as Miriam said, those are companies who uh, only look at profit. They only want profit. We need other companies. We need uh, companies who say, yes, we want profit, but we want to do it in an honest way. We want to do it without any violation of human rights. And to be able to get there, I'm sure that there are many obstacles. I know that it will be difficult to obtain, of course, because I'm sure that multinationals will do everything to go against it. A lot of states will go against it. And a lot of individuals will be against it. Just imagine companies who are corrupt already for years. States who uh, have a lot of bad habits, uh, who profit from corruption. Uh, they will be against such an initiative, of course. That's one big obstacle. How are we going to deal with that? But also the egocentric society we live in, actually. I mean, uh, companies are egocentric. The politicians are egocentric. Uh, I think uh, that's also a problem. And as Miriam has said, I think that uh, if we really work together, if we have allies, if uh, uh, the international community uh, works together, then I am sure that we can do this, that we can go for a better global economy and an economy where the human beings are at the center of the economy. That's my vision of the future. Um, but just, um, Sylvester, very, in a very uh, concrete uh, way, how would this uh, tribunal be? Where would it be located? And uh, who will be the lawyers and the prosecutors? And how do you imagine um, uh, this kind of uh, world economic tribunal? I think that tribunal, we should make sure that it's situated in a country 
which has a symbolic value, a country where they respect human rights, so that it is a symbolic uh, tribunal as well. If it's a tribunal in a corrupt state, for example, then no one will think that it's credible. We should have that tribunal in a state where they respect human rights. Who would be the lawyers? Who would be the judges? Well, I think there should be some kind of complementarity between lawyers of the third world, lawyers coming from the countries where the human rights are being violated, but we also need international lawyers. We need a symbiosis, a symbiosis of both worlds. And I think that we should really do that if you want to have a universal tribunal. So all the judges, all the magistrates work there. Well, they should be 50-50 from the south, from the north. But the most important thing is their morals. I think the morals of the people who work there are the most important. They have to be people who have a high integrity, uh, people who are competent, uh, people who are intelligent, uh, people who know the international law, but they also have to know uh, the national laws. Uh, so those uh, lawyers, judges uh, have to inspire confidence and trust. And I think, of course, that uh, the rules uh, they have to uh, use uh, have to be independent it has to be an independent tribunal a neutral tribunal uh, a, a tribunal which will respect all the principles uh, of the human rights uh, of uh, the uh, international conventions and i believe it is possible to have such a tribunal and i think it's necessary most of all because the impunity is still ongoing in many countries in the world. Impunity is happening every minute and everyone is silenced about it. We are silent about it. I mean, look at my country, look at what happens in my country. But Beni is a city. It was a city which was attacked already for five years. Uh, we have rebels coming into that city. We know that everyone knows that and no one is stopping it. Why isn't the uh, government doing anything about it? Why isn't the international community not doing anything about it? Everyone knows that these attacks are happening and no one is doing anything. So we need a tribunal who looks at these kind of cases, who wants to find out the truth, who wants to listen to the victims, who wants to give a voice to the victims. And once they uh, rule on something, uh, that has to be applied. Now, I know that I have a lot of big dreams, uh, but that's the way I look at it. Miriam, what is um, your... Um vision of this uh, tribunal yes yeah, so uh, i would say i i agree uh, on a lot of points with sylvester on how he portrayed on how the tribunal should be working and and put together um but i want to be also be a little bit provocative and the question if if, if it's if it really is a world tribunal tribunal that we want no because i think um i think there are different levels because if you of course, there is a level where we need justice and we need um, justice for the atrocities and the cases that have that we see and that are being dealt with, no? And, um, and I think probably also on this comment, you know, is it, do we need the tribunal so that it, be, it becomes obvious that uh, the justice is lacking? On the one hand, yes, but on the other, obviously also in, in some of the cases being discussed, you do see that the national justice systems are somewhat dealing with this and then fail to deal with it. And so, so yes, I think the tribunal is a bit about something else. I think the problem you have always have in law is that law narrows down aspects. And I think 
the chance of a tribunal like this is that it can be wider and it can tell a story in a more complex way and it can show um, responsibilities and how things link together better than I think you would you could in any lawsuit that you can imagine before any tribunal, no? Mm -hmm. So, and I think if you think about this, obviously we need better laws and we need clearer rules. Mm, and then we need courts also to enforce those rules. I personally think it, that the enforcement must be usually more on the national level. It must be in the Congo, it must be in Switzerland, it must be anywhere. I don't think that we only need to hope for one big tribunal that will solve things. Um, and then, but I think it's also not only about bringing case after case after case before a tribunal that will, that, I mean, I, I have doubts that this will change everything, but, but what can, I think the contribution of individual cases and tribunals and real court proceedings can have is that they can contribute to wider debates and to wider dynamics that actually create change, no? So, so I think, um, you know, our economic systems will not be more just, just because we have a court, and it, be it an international court or functioning national court systems. Um, but what we need is, uh, yeah, we need, there must be, our economic system must be democratized much more. There must be, uh, the, the questions, who's making a decision about where to open a mine or not, is that is a decision that must be done by the community affected, by the country in which it's located, you know, by the population, and not just by either governments that are more or less corrupt or, or by companies that, that are just powerful and have the interest. No? So I think, um, so I think while I, I obviously as a lawyer, I, I do see the value in law and cases and lawsuits and tribunals, but I also think we can't overestimate the effect that this has, no? Because it's always somehow, you know, they always come late when already things have gone wrong. Um, and we need to get into a different position where we change things before they go wrong. Um, so, Sylvester, I um, let you uh, the last comment of the conversation. We will um, uh, finish this uh, soon. So, um, do you want to add something um, to this? Uh. What I would like to say is that I'm very happy that uh, this uh, project that started uh, with Milo and the Congo Tribunal is continuing now. And uh, it's incredible to see how much interest the Congolese people have in this project. Uh, we went to Lumumbashi, we went uh, to Kovesi, everywhere people participated in this project. They were very interested. Uh, they uh, did a lot of things. They volunteered uh, because, yes, we have suffered. We have suffered a lot and people have things to say. And they've had now the possibility to talk there were hearings they were able to say what they have lived they were able to say how they suffered that's that's a first and of course they hope that this tribunal will actually make a change and they are convinced that it is possible if our national authorities will listen to the victims if they would just hear what they have to say we believe that they might change we believe that they might change. We believe that the international community might change their opinion if they actually hear what we have to say. So that's why those hearings, that's why this tribunal is so important. And that is what gives us courage. We have now a lot of new courage thanks to this initiative. And now we're going to talk to the national authorities, to the international authorities, and we have hope again. We have hope again. We believe that we can change things. And step by step, who knows, we will have a great change, a better change for a better world. Thank you very much, Sylvester. That was a, a very good last comment. Um, so for everyone who would like to um, see what uh, happened um, during the Colvesi hearings, uh, you can follow this, uh, as I said, on Sunday um, at between four and uh, seven, 
you can follow it on the live stream um, on the Facebook page of, um, of IIPM International Institute of Political Murder. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, yes, I will uh, close this discussion now. Thank you very much.